Anybody bring their Bible to church today? Got your Bible? It's the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. All right, some of you grew up in, how many grew up in Sunday school? Yeah, 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 yeah. You remember that song. Hey, we're going to look at uh, the seventh book in the Bible. So we go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, chapter 3. First one there, round trip ticket to Madrid, Spain. Yes, yes, only on our 22nd birthday, round trip ticket. And uh, you're going to need to see Pastor Tammy. She'll set you up with that round trip ticket. Hey, we're in week number two in our series I started last week. How many were here last Sunday? Let me see your hand. And uh, what a great, I, I love that passage, 1 Samuel chapter 14, about Jonathan and his armor bearer, and hopefully you were uh, stirred, you were stirred to live a unsafe life. How many of you know sometimes following Jesus, it's not smooth and it's not safe, sometimes it's a little radical and a little risky? Where are the real Christians at in the house? You know what I'm talking about? And so we're in uh, week number two, and uh, I, this, I love this story. I love the Bible. I love, uh, it's, you're going to laugh a little bit. You're going to kind of be blown away a little bit about the passage. And uh, we're going to get there probably in five or six minutes. I promise you we're going to read the Bible, but we probably won't get there for a few minutes. And I was telling the first service, I was so tempted to, to title this message, When Lefty Killed Hefty. And I thought, oh, some people might get offended a little bit. And you're going to understand why. I thought about naming uh, the, uh, the title, uh, When Lefty Killed Hefty, but I, I, I didn't go there. Instead, the title of my message is, Enough is Enough. Come on. Let's all say it out loud together. Ready? One, two, three, go. Do you ever have your father, like you're goofing around with your brothers and sisters, and you're breaking stuff, and you're throwing stuff, and my dad would just stop and like, Enough is enough. It's like time, right? right? And uh, turn to your neighbor with an attitude, like a big attitude, and say, Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Come on, that's the title of my message today. What is the title of my message? I already forgot. What is it? Enough is enough. Enough is enough. And you're going to figure out why in just a second. So God, we ask your blessing on the word as it goes forth. And we thank you for your goodness and faithfulness. And we're not just asking you to to anoint the reading of the word of God, not only the hearing of the word of God, but more importantly, the doing of the word of God. So we ask that the Holy Spirit would be here in a powerful way to teach us and correct us and exhort us. And God, we thank you for 22 years of faithfulness here at New Life Community Church. The numbers of people that have come to Christ and been water baptized and marriages have been healed and bodies that have been reconciled and dreams that have been fulfilled. We give you all the thanks and all the praise. God, we declare that we are nothing. You are everything. And without you, God, we declare we're nothing. We thank you for your goodness and faithfulness in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. Hey, uh, hey, what's up? Second service. How many of you, uh, with your hand raised, how many have ever been to like a really bougie restaurant, like like upscale? Come on, raise your hand. Keep it up, would you, just for a second? I want to look at all the rich people in the church here and... uh, (laughs) And make sure that you're tithing and stuff. So, come on, you ever been to, how many ever been to Mastro's in Thousand Oaks or Malibu? Awesome restaurant. I love Mastro's. What I even love better about Mastro's is gift cards from Mastro's. So if the Lord would happen to put that on your heart. No, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. But uh, I've been to Mastro's. And I remember years ago, um, we, our church is probably a year or two old. And, and uh, my uh, Old senior pastor at South Coast, John Huffman, invited me to go to the Philippines with him on a mission trip. And so cool. I love when people say this. He's like, hey, you don't need to bring any money. The whole trip is on me. And we flew a business class international, which is like way better than first class domestic. And literally, uh, we got on the plane and she said, would you like the steak or the lobster? I said, hallelujah. And uh, I'm used to like a fish eye sandwich on a domestic flight. And uh, so we went to the Philippines for eight or nine days. And then we had one day, one night and two days in Hong Kong. Uh, what a beautiful city that is. And he said, I'm going to take you to Ruth's Chris. Have you ever been there? And again, I, I was a youth pastor and I started, I think when I started the church, I was making like $24,000 a year. And I'm like, I can't even spell Ruth's Chris. Not, not only can I not spell it, I would never eat there. I can't afford it. He goes, it's on me. And, uh, but if you've ever been to like an upscale bougie restaurant and stuff, uh, they, they came out and, you know, they got the napkins over here and the guy's pouring water from like 18 stories up and, and uh, it's just like, that's really fancy and the napkin's really fancy and the table setting's really fancy. And I was so excited to have this amazing meal and then they bring out my entree. And when they brought out my entree, it looked really cool and had little sauces and all these little accoutrements and, and fried chives and stuff. But when they brought it out, literally the food was like this big. 
the whole entree, sides included, come on. You know what I'm talking about? And I just discovered I don't really care how fancy it looks. I don't care that you speak French. I don't care that you could pour water from 18 stories up. I want a lot of food. Come on. I want a lot of food. I'm not, I'm not really impressed. And, and true story, I ate the whole thing in like two seconds and I was starving. And it was like a hundred bucks. And uh, so then they bring a dessert menu to me and, and uh, they want dessert. And I'm like, yes. And he said, I would recommend the, uh, ice, uh, the scoop of ice cream and the chocolate chip cookie. I'm like, bring it on. And so I was so excited because I was still hungry and they brought out the, what I thought was a scoop. <laughs> Wasn't a scoop, it was a dollop of ice cream. It was, uh, it was like this big and the cookie wasn't much better and I ate that and I'm still hungry and so disappointed, so underwhelmed. I was so looking forward to having this amazing food and it was awesome that he spoke French and it was awesome that they had nice uh, table settings, but I want to eat a lot of food is the point of my sermon right here. And I was, my experience at Ruth's Chris was just so underwhelming. And I thought, how many people in our church, how many people that serve Jesus Christ, your Christian experience is a lot like my trip to Roos Chris. And it's because, I, I think it's because of this, because you pray to prayer and because you come to a church, but, but that's really it. And let me just say this, God never called anyone to live a safe life. He wants us to step out of the boat and live a radical, committed, bold, hey, take some risk in Jesus. And I think why some people, their walk with Christ is a little dull and boring and, and, and underwhelming, it's because you're, we're not living it right. Let me just say this, to, to really go after God is a whole lot of fun. Sometimes it's messy, sometimes it's risky, but it's a whole lot of fun. And so I'm going to give you three things, if it's okay, out of the text. We're going to read. I promise you we're going to get to the Bible, but I want to ask you a couple questions uh, as, we, as we go. Typically, we'll stand up and read a text, and then I'll pray, and you can sit down, but we're not doing it that way. It's the birthday party. We're doing something different. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're doing something different. So here it is. Here it is. Three questions I want to ask you. Ready? Would you write down these questions, please? Because if you write something down, you're going to retain the information a little better. Here's the first question I want to ask you, and we'll get to the text in a second. First question is this, what bothers you? I want to ask you that question, what bothers you? Let's, before we get to the spiritual what bothers you, is it okay if we just have some fun and talk about pet peeves? Is that okay? Can I just be frank? Is it okay? Come on, give me a little liberty on our birthday party. To, I just want to be... And, and if you're going to be offended, it's okay. Just all emails go to Pastor Andrew Carroll at newlifefoxner.com. So these are just some of the things that bother me. Look at me. Um, you people, some of you people that have little dogs and you bring them to the store in the movie theater, that bothers me. And some of you bring them on an airplane. If I see your dog on the airplane, I will rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't bring your dogs, don't bring your cats anywhere. They are meant to stay in your backyard. And all the Christians said, amen in the house. Yeah, bothers me. It bothers me when you're at a restaurant or on an airplane. You ever like land at the airplane and then Joe Blow picks up his phone. He's like, yeah, yeah, we just landed right now. Yeah, we're about to, and if you can just put. You're at the restaurant, it's really quiet. And you having a nice romantic dinner with your spouse? Yeah, I think if you go ahead and sell high, sell high, 22, 20, just like, like you're driving me crazy. Like, are you serious? Like, it's quiet. Don't you pick up the clue phone. That, sorry. That bothers me. Um, I'm getting in a bad mood on our birthday party. You know what bothers me? I'm sitting on the couch. I mean, they're going over my notes because I have it on Dropbox. Or I'm reading a book, and somebody in our family, remember, it's quiet. I'm going over my notes. I'm trying to hear from the Holy Spirit. I got a message to preach tomorrow. It's really quiet, super quiet. And uh, it's just me going over my notes and the Holy Spirit because I got a sermon to pre prepare and pray about and preach. And it's really quiet. Is it loud in the house? No, it's really quiet. And it's so quiet. I'm just like totally reading and getting into it and God speaking some things. And then I hear something like this. And, and, and I'm not going to tell you which one of my three kids, but he does this all the time. Like I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to pay attention. And why are you, why are you listening to Instagram stories in the middle of my, that really bothers me. Would you extend your hand toward the front row? My son here is on the front row. 
father in the name. Just kidding. And so that really bothers me. Hey, do we have any uh, students in here, kids, that uh, your parents do some things that bother you? Come on, raise your hand. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually asked all three of my kids yesterday, could you name one thing that I do that bothers you? They couldn't come up with one. And uh, <laughs> just kidding. That whole list of things that Tammy does that bother, but, but they couldn't think of one. Hey, parents, do you have a couple things that your kids do that bother you? Can, like after you're done eating, can you please clean up after yourself and wipe down the counter and put the dishes away? And those are some things. Yeah, yeah. All the parents. Are, oh, they all woke up right now. All the parents. Are like, yeah, man, preacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, is this a safe service? Is this safe? Spouses? Where are the married people at? Yeah. Okay. Is it, I'm just going to go there. My wife's on the front row. I'll just kind of look at this section over here. So, Hi, guys. Um, do you, married people, do you have any, a couple things that your spouse does that just drives you insane? Come on. Don't, I know you can't raise your hand. It's very dangerous. Don't look at them. Just look right into my eyes. It's just you and I and smile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just, I just, <laughs> why, here's, why do we have to have 18 pillows on our bed is just what I want to know. Come on, any other married, you know what, like, it takes me 18 minutes to make the bed every day because we don't need that many pillows and all the married men said amen, right? And uh, so things that, things that bother us, bother us. But, and how many, know, let, let's just, can I go here? Yes, I will. Let me, do you know there, there are a lot of things here, here at this church, that if you're not careful, I mean, we could all pick out probably 12 things that already took place today that bother us. Like I used to go to the church and, and he used to wear slacks and a white shirt and a tie. Now he has skinny jeans and a, that bothers me and the lights bother me and the sound bothers me and the haze bothers me and this bothers me. And, and we could do that because there's a lot to complain about in every church. Isn't that true? And, uh, but I would just say this, instead of like picking out all the things that we don't like, that bother us, that it used to be like this, now it's like this. Can we just say this, that the presence of God is in this place. People are getting saved. They're coming to Christ. 45 people last week were water baptized. I might not like everything. I might not agree with everything. I might be, I might be bothered by some things. Is it a little loud? Sometimes probably it's okay. Depends who you ask. Older people, yeah, it's definitely too loud. Younger people, they can't hear anything. Everybody's got in bed. Right, right. So there's going to be some things that we can complain about and bother about. How about this though? How about this? I used to love, my kids played at Real Mason. They had the shirt. It said, we is greater than me. That's it. So I might not agree with everything, but if this is the best thing for our church, even if I have some things that really bother me, hey, as long as the presence of God is in this place, lives are getting changed, and people are coming to cry, that's the most important thing, okay? Sorry, I got really passionate there. That wasn't even on my notes. That was just the Holy Spirit there, okay? So what, what, but, but not on a practical level, not on an emotional level, not on a relational level, but what bothers you on a spiritual level? In the text, let me tell you what's taking place in the text. Uh, the Israelites have gone through, uh, it, they're actually over the Red Sea, into the Promised Land, and they're enjoying a life of freedom, okay? But how many know that if you're not careful, listen to me, the longer that you're serving God, if you're not careful, you can get, I can get, comfortable. Comfortable. And so the Israelites started to get comfortable and they started serving other gods, small g gods. And uh, God would raise up a judge, not like a judge that you think like courtroom judge with a black, black robe. No, no, no. A political and a spiritual leader. And so God's people would start sinning, then they would cry out, God would provide a judge, they'd get comfortable, they'd go back into their ways, and so this kind of goes on through the book of Judges. So finally God, God raises up a guy by the name of Ehud, everyone says the name, his name is Ehud, and it's a great story in the Old Testament, and uh, so they were, they were in bondage, check it out, Israel was in bondage for 18 years, can you imagine that? It's hard for us to imagine being a country, you, the United States of America, in bondage, we don't even understand that, we've never been in captivity. The closest thing we have is Pearl Harbor in 1942 and the attack at 9-11. But to be in bondage by an oppressor, that's not even on our radar. And so, so finally this guy Ehud's like, I'm tired of it, man. It's not right. And so pick up the story. Judges chapter 3, verse 12. You got your Bibles there? And we're going to read all the way down to verse 30. <gasps> yeah. Yeah, because God's word's amazing. Thank you, seven people. Because God's word's amazing. Again, here it is. Again, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. 
getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for how long? 18 years. So there, see the pattern? God raises up a judge. They get comfortable. They turn from God. They start serving other gods. God raises up a judge. Now he raises up a guy by the name of Ehud. Ehud's like, I'm tired of this. Enough is enough. God's people should not be in bondage. Check it out. I'm going to give you the goal of my sermon up front. Ready? The goal of my sermon is to light a fire under every person in this room to be so bothered to do something radical for Jesus Christ. Why are only 13 people clapping right now? I want to do that. I want to to stir you up to just be so bothered to say, you know what? Enough is enough. And so I think everybody else is probably talking to each other saying, hey, this is, we're getting tired of this. People are probably saying it. They were probably praying and fasting about being in bondage, but only one guy said, I'm doing something about it. Right. Enough is enough. So I mentioned last week about we have two dogs, not by choice. <laughs> Can I tell you about our two dogs? Um, so before we got the two dogs, not by choice, um, our kids talked about having dogs. Our kids showed us pictures about having dogs. Our kids wrote up a contract about what it would look like when we got the dogs, things that they agreed to do, 10 things that have never happened. And and we got the dogs and, is this okay if I share this? It's kind of therapeutic for my wife and I to talk about two dogs that we don't want. And um, and so we got the pictures, we got the, dad, we got a dog, it's gonna be comforting, and Riley's going off to school, and we're gonna kind of miss her, and so we're not bringing the dog, and we got a contract, and we're gonna 10 things, and Ready? They liked the idea of owning a dog, but they didn't like the responsibility of having a dog. Come on, come on, where are my parents at? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, hey, couple questions. How many of you think that our church should keep reaching out to our city? Come on. How many believe that we should do something about 1,700 people that are homeless in our city? And, and, and do you know that in the county, just in the last year, the county in the, in the county in the last year has gone up 20%? How many think that, that we should probably do something about that? How many think that, uh, how many think that, do you know that, that babies are getting aborted each and every day in our county? How many think we should like just sit back and say, oh, okay, sirrah, sirrah, or should we kind of, do you think as a church we should probably step up and do something about that? How about, I, like this, this really bothers me. It really bothers me when kids, little kids or junior high kids get bullied by, and if I found out somebody in our youth group is getting bullied, I'm showing up to school with you, and I'll just put the pastor guy aside, and, and I'll take down that little 12-year-old kid in Jesus' name, so. And, how many are bothered that the fact that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how many are bothered that, that people are caught in like this opioid addiction is crazy. And I, I'm kind of bothered about that, all the addictions and pornography. And I think as a church, man, we, but, but listen, here's what, if I'm not careful, here's what I start thinking. Well, God's going to raise up somebody else to do that. So I, I just said, how many of you think everybody, yeah, yeah, amen, that's so good. Come on, preach it. But what if I say, hey. But what if God tells you to do it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. No, no, I don't know about that. I think, I think if God raised, no, 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 no. But God might want you to do it. God, God might want, but maybe you're the Ehud. Say, hey, enough is enough. I'm going to do something about bowling. I'm going to do something about abortion. I, I probably every morning uh, get here early, do my devotions, have coffee, study, whatever. And about 9 or 9.30, I'm just tired of sitting down. So I walk around the block and I get over to this clinic over here and there's a, there's two girls, two sisters that hold up signs just saying that God loves you and God created kids. And finally, I went over there and I just said, hey, thank you for doing this. And she goes, yeah, me and my sister just volunteer. And we've had opportunities to talk and to pray with ladies coming in to have an abortion. And we've actually talked gals out of having an abortion. And, and sometimes our conversation didn't change the decision that they made. But honestly, I was like, Is, what, can we, what can we do as a church because I want to tell you, I feel like a failure as a pastor, and I feel like we have failed as a church on this issue. Right. How, how can we help? Well, I think, you know, if God, if we pray, God will raise somebody up. But maybe God wants to use you to do that. So, so what are you bothered about? I want to light a fire under you to be so bothered. 
You know, when we started the church in 97, people were like, why would you start a church? There's already 100 churches in Oxnard. One, one prophetic prayer lady said, I think it's a bad decision. Why are you starting a church? And if I were to tell her, because I was too young and dumb back then, I would say this. Because all the churches I knew back then, and no indictment on any church back in 1997, but most of them were not growing. I think the biggest one was a couple hundred people, and they weren't growing, and nobody was getting saved, and they weren't changing the city, and they weren't making an impact. So that's why we're starting. We were bothered that I think church should be fun. I think church should be a place where we grow, and we celebrate the goodness of God, and we didn't see that. So we're like, hey, we want to do something about it. And we haven't done it perfectly, but we were bothered to do it. Check out in verse 15. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera, the Benjamite. The Israelites sent him with the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Number one. See, that kid's bothered right now, which is a good thing. <laughs> bothered by my preaching. Look at me. Look at me. What, what bothers you? What bothers you? God wants to use you. Number two, here's the second question you need to ask yourself. How am I gifted? How has God gifted me? How has God gifted me? Notice in verse 15 again, Ehud was a left-handed man. You got you to know this. The Bible doesn't just throw out words or phrases because it's kind of a cool thing. He was not right-handed. He was what? How many of you are left-handed? Raise your hand. Keep it up really high. These are all the real Christians in our church right now, like <laughs> anointed, called, gift. So... Some of you don't know this, I write with my left hand, which I hated, like growing up, you write with your left hand and the, you know, you would write and then it would smear the whole page. So there's some pros and cons about being left hand. I write with my left, I eat with my left, I kick with my left, all my racket sports are left, except I bat right, I throw right, I shoot right. You're like, oh, that explains a lot, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a little messed up, but, but there's some pros and cons to being left-handed. I, my oldest daughter, when she was five, or we'd be in the backyard and she would kind of shoot. And I'm like, no, you got, this is your main hand. This, this is just holding the ball. And it's mostly, and she kept going like. And then I discovered, oh, she's not right-handed. She shoots left-handed. Notice in the text, Ehud is a left-handed man from the tribe of Benjamin. Ready? He's a left-handed man from, the tribe of Benjamin actually means people of the right hand. You get it? Here's a left-handed guy being used by God from a tribe that's right-handed. What? Interpretation, ready? He didn't fit in. He didn't fit in. Have you ever felt like you didn't fit in at church? One of the dumb things we do in churches all over the U.S. is we, when somebody comes to Christ, we try to form them to talk and look like everyone else. Well, I think, I don't think people should have tattoos and come to church. Well, you need to get a life. Okay? Now, I don't have any tattoos. I'm not really into tattoos. But listen, if you want to have a tattoo, great. Different colors of people, ages of people. We, we don't want to talk the same, look the same. Hey, we're, we're diverse and we're unique. And uh, so God takes a left-handed guy from a right-handed tribe who didn't fit in. I felt like that going to Bible college with a bunch of pastor's kids and missionary kids. And uh, I felt like I didn't fit in. So instead of trying to conform everyone to talk the same and look the same and worship the same, let's celebrate our diversity and our uniqueness. Come on. So Ehud, a left-handed guy from a right-handed tribe, probably felt like he didn't fit in. But... Who better use God to use a left-handed guy from a right-handed tribe? People, yeah, but man, if Pastor Steve, if you had, no, if you had any idea about my past, because you talked about abortion, I've had several. Okay, but who better would to be able to minister to somebody thinking about having an abortion right now than someone that's already had one? Yeah, but I mean, the shame of my past, the guilt of my past, man, if you only knew... I came out of a gay lifestyle. Okay, but who better to minister to somebody in the lifestyle than somebody that came out of the lifestyle? I, I've never done drugs in my life. I used to drink a lot of alcohol. So I, I have a hard time, like, I'm just, I, like, internally, I'm just thinking, like, quit. So I'm not the guy. But here's the guy or the gal, somebody that came out of the lifestyle to minister and to give hope to someone that's in it right now. Hey, hey. A, ga a gangbanger. Who better to reach gangbangers in our city or our county than somebody that came out of a gang? 
We did not have gangs in Westlake Village except for a gang of kids driving Mercedes Benz around. That's all we had. So I, I'm probably not going to be the guy. I can say a couple things, but, but if you were in jail or prison or in a gang, you're going to be a great vessel that God can use to reach those people. Hey, God loves using misfits and people that have blown it. The Bible is filled with people. David an adulterer. Paul is a Christian killer. But I want to ask you a question, what, how are you gifted? How was God gifted? I've talked to people in our church, say, 10 years. Hey, what's your spiritual gift? And they're like, huh? What is your spiritual gift? What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Paul, you, you've been saved for 20 years and you don't know what your spiritual gift is? And here's the reason why, because I was raised in the Catholic Church. I never remember anybody talking about spiritual gifts. And if you were raised in the Lutheran Church or the Methodist Church or the Catholic Church, they didn't talk about the Holy Spirit. It was kind of like your crazy Uncle Eddie. You don't talk about him. And then I started reading the Bible. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about there's some, there's apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. And then you go to Romans chapter 12, there's the gift of giving and leading and organizing, administration. First Corinthians chapter 12, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discernment, tongues, interpretation. Of tongues. There's like 25, 30 different gifts. And you talk to people and they're like, I don't know. You got to find out because God has gifted you. Check out this verse. I use it all the time. First Peter chapter 4 verse 10 says, God has past tense, present tense, future tense. God has given. What is that? Past, thank you, one person that took English in high school. God has given, past tense. He's, if you're a Christian, God has given you, who, who, each of you. Raise your hand if you're an each. Hey, everybody, God has already given you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Why? So I can have a lot of Instagram followers? So I can impress people with my preaching? No, use them to serve other people. Man, I, I, honestly, I wish I could sit down at Starbucks and have coffee, not coffee, espresso, espresso with you and just say, hey, you are so called by God, anointed by God, competent, God's anointed you, everybody in the room. Here's the thing I hate. I hate to, that anybody in our church would think that what goes on up here is anything more important than what goes on down there. I'm just like you. I'm not any more called, gifted, or anointed than anybody in the room. All of us have a gift. I just don't, I just don't know what it is. Can you help me? Yeah, just a couple things. Number one, what do you like to do? And even when I say that, people are like, what? I get to like some stuff as a Christian? I thought it was just about all the things you don't get to get. No, no, no. God has given us all things to enjoy. What do you like? Man, I just, I love kids. You'd probably be great in the children's ministry. I don't know. I just love like techie stuff and figuring stuff out and lights and cameras. You'd probably be great in the booth. I, I, I love teenagers. There's probably two people that think that, but I love teenagers. <laughs> Well, you can come on Wednesday night and be part of the leadership team. And, and what do you like? What do you enjoy? Number two, what are you good at? What do you, some of you are just amazing. You, you, you're so administrative and organized. Some of you are such encouragers. Some of you are so hospitable. You just love having people over. You love taking people out to lunch and dinner. And, and so you love that? You're good at that? Do it. And check it out. You have to have both of those things, by the way. I'm good at it, and I like it. Yeah, I always wonder, do you ever wonder this about American Idol? How do you even get to the first audition on television? <laughs> Who told you that you have a good voice? <laughs> the other day they sang, and they're, it's like, are there family members telling, like, dude, you, your voice is awesome. I'd be like, you should stick to painting. You can't sing at all. But anyhow, you got to like it, and you have to enjoy it. And then here's another thing. Like, how, how? is the gift that God's given you, how would that best serve and benefit other people? Yes. I, let me just say, so I, I love teaching, I love preaching. Not only do I love teaching and preaching God's word, I just love, I love teaching people. I played racquetball yesterday and there's two young kids, maybe one's 12, the other one's 14. And they're just starting to play and right after the game was over, I just said, hey, can I teach you a couple things? You wanna read the ball here in strategy? And I just love teaching people. I love, I love preaching, is it hard, exhausting? Yes. Because right after today is over, I'll go home and sit on my couch and I'll start thinking about next week already. It's all consuming, but I love to do it. What do you love? What do you love? Check this out. Here's what we decided when we started the church. It's opposite of a lot of churches. We never had this idea, we want to recruit you to do our thing. No, 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 no. We're not recruiting you to do our ministry. Ready? 
We want to empower you and release you to do what you're passionate about. Come on, somebody, more than eight people. So what is it? What are you bothered by? What are you bothered by? I release you. No, I got to call the church. You are the church. Who are you talking about when you say you got to call the church? You're the church. Point to the church. We're the church. It's not a building. It's people. So number two, how has God gifted me? I want to share this. I share this. A lot of training for life, this illustration. How many of you like puzzles? Puzzles? Okay. Here's the puzzles. I like eight pieces. You know, it's for like a five-year-old. I'm like, I could do the, but like the thousand-piece puzzle, I have no patience for any of that. But some of you do. And what do you do? You clear out the whole dining room table, and you open up that thousand puzzle piece box, and where do you start? On the corners. And you're like, hey, are you hosting Thanksgiving? No, because I got a puzzle on my dining room. I'm going to your house. So 11 years later, you're still working on that thing. You get like 10 pieces left. True? And you finally get to, have you ever got to the very end? Oh, I'm almost there. And then there's like two pieces missing. <laughs> I just spent a decade of my life. Have you ever noticed too in puzzle boxes, they don't give you extra pieces like they do like buttons when you buy a shirt. Ready? Because every piece in the puzzle fits somewhere. Ready, 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 ready? Here's a puzzle piece. There's another one, 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 there's another one. And, and everybody fits here. So check it out. When you skip out and don't serve and don't get involved, then we're lesser for it. But the more people we have serving and giving, then the greater, the stronger, and the better the presentation of the gospel is. So I don't want to empower, I want to empower you and release you to do what God has bothered you to do. What are you disturbed about? I, I bless you in the name of Jesus and I say, go for it. Well, well, I used to do it our other, I put in my 20 years. Can you imagine your teenager coming to you? I've been doing chores for two years now. I'm done. <laughs> no, you're 70 or you're 80. You can be used in a powerful way. You can, you can pray and you can lead a little Bible study and you can mentor some younger leaders. And we don't do, put in time. No. We're not done serving God until he comes back or he takes us home, right? And I'm just telling you, the more people we have, the better it's going to be. A couple months ago, I came out of my bathroom in my office and I had my outfit on for Sunday. I was like, my wife kind of looked at me like, she says, all that doesn't matter. I don't know what it was, shoes or something. And we're probably 10 minutes before the first service. I had to run home and got a new outfit and I came back and I never, I've never seen this because I'm always here bef almost before anybody else gets here. I never saw this. We're probably 10 minutes before the first service and I pull in to the party. I'm like, what in the world is going on out there? It was like Disneyland. All these parking guys, guys on the golf cart. I'm like, how do you get that job? I want to sign up for a golf cart ministry, man. And golf carts and people are, signs and stuff. And I'm like, this is awesome, all these cars. And I never realized like all the pieces that were making this church happen. Then you come in here and then you got the tech and the worship and lights and this guy on cafe and you got security and they got there talking to one another. And I'm like, this is, this is the church, man. Like my wife said, doing church together as a team. And, and we've done some great things with five or 600 volunteers, what if we can empower all 4,000 of us? 3,000, and just say, hey, let's get bothered about some things and we empower you and release you to do what God has called you to do. Anybody have a bulletin here? Look at the back of the bulletin, I highlighted it. Back of the bulletin, bottom left-hand corner says, senior pastors, the most reverend Steve and Tammy Abraham. <laughs> ministers, ministers. Uh-huh. I can't see it. I don't have my reading glasses on. What does it say? What? Is that a typo? No. No, no, the ministers are the pastors and the staff at New Life. That must be a misprint. No, that's the Bible. The Bible says that God has given pastors ready. He's given them the assignment to equip people for them to do the work of the ministry. That's it. My, my job is just to come teach and disciple you and release you and equip you for you to do the work of the ministry. So check it out. You're sitting next to a full-time minister of the gospel. So why don't you introduce yourself to your neighbor there and say, man, I'm full-time. I'm full-time.
Here's the, uh, here's the third thing. Number three, what opportunities are in front of us? Is it okay if I read a couple of verses? Actually, we've got to read a lot of verses. Verse 17. You got it? Verse 17. He presented the tribute. It's basically taxes to Eglon, king of Moab. They're the group that's oppressing the Israelites. Who was a very, I love the Bible. Who was a very, what does your Bible say? Fat. Was a very fat man. <gasps> Pastor Steve, I'm, I don't think that's really um, appropriate in church. I don't think it's... Uh, I don't think it's politically correct. I think we should probably choose another word, like maybe chubby. Uh, can, we, can we go with like maybe big bone or fluffy? Yeah, let's go with fluffy, because there's a comedian named Fluffy. Well, let's just go with fluffy. No, we're going to go with fat, because that's what the Bible says. He was a very fat man. After he had presented the tribute of the taxes, he sent... He sent on their way those who had carried it, but on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, Leave us, and they all left. That's a miracle in itself. You don't leave the king all by himself at the palace. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. He's probably thinking, This is awesome. God's going to speak to me directly. I got a message from God from you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand. You got my sword here? Everybody look right here? Yeah. Commercial. Sword. They say the sword was anywhere between 12 and 18 inches. This is a little bigger. Ready? Here's the reason why Ehud was left-handed. If you were right-handed, you would keep your sword either on the inner or the outer thigh. You would pull it out with your right. But the Bible says he was. So he would keep it probably on the inner thigh. And so he's left-handed, right? So... Ready? Why? Why? Because he, I mean, no, he's got like a whole bunch of people at the front of the palace saying, like TSA, take your shoes off. They got security there. They got x-ray, the whole thing. Uh, but they didn't have that back then. They probably had a guy, like, they were ch just checking for the left thigh because most people were right-handed. So th that's just the supernatural hand of God right there, that he rose up a left-hander. So they, they wouldn't check for the sword over here. So the Bible says that God used Ehud, a left-handed man. You following? Where did I leave off? 21. He reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. Ugh. Check this out. Even the handle sank in after the blade and his bowels discharged. It's like Braveheart. <laughs> Ehud did not pull the sword out and the fat closed in over it. All of God's people said, Ugh. this is awesome. I, again, how many of you were raised in the church you went to Sunday school? You know, be, before we have all this high-tech stuff that we have now, they used to have flannel graphs. Remember that? They put the Bible stories on flannel graphs. I've never seen an Ehud flannel graph. What would that look like? There'd be blood all over the flannel graph everywhere. Hey, here it is. Sometimes serving Jesus can get messy. But check it out. As the king went down, the oppressor that's been oppressing God's people for 18 years, when he went down, the nation started celebrating. I came to church to let you know 2,000 years ago, we had an oppressor, we had an evil one, we had Satan himself trying to oppress him, but 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a cross. Come on, the Bible says in Colossians, he disarmed principalities and powers and he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So Ehud takes out the king. The nation's going to go crazy. Let's pick up the story in verse 23. Then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. After he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. They said, he must be relieving himself. He's going to the bathroom. He's in the inner room of the palace. So they waited to the point of embarrassment. Isn't that great? Hey, hey. You Okay. Yeah, um, you ever been in the bathroom and people are like, hey, you okay in there? <laughs> Sorry to get so graphic. Yeah, I'm just uh, having some issues. <laughs> At Menudo this morning. <laughs> That's so great. They waited to the point of embarrassment. How long was that? I don't know. They're, it's like, dude, what are you doing in there? Facebook, ESPN score? Come on. So they waited to the point of embarrassment, but when they, he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. There he saw the Lord fallen to the floor dead. While they waited, he had got away. He passed by the stone images and escaped to 
I tried to practice this, Sira, Syra, who cares? When they arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with them from the hills with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab your enemy into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about, how many? 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. No one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and he, the land had peace for how long? The land had peace for how long? Why? Why? Because it was one guy, not a group of people. It was just one guy that said, you know what? I'm so bothered. It's not right that our people are caught in bondage. It's not right that the enemy has been oppressing them. One guy was bothered enough and says, you know what? I'm going to get bothered enough, disturbed enough, use my gifts and to do something radical and unsafe. He was all alone, all by himself. I just wondered if, if everybody else was talking about it. We should probably do something, praying about it, fasting about it. But only one guy. Probably God said, hey, Ehud, are you willing to do it? I want to know, do we have any Ehuds in the church right now? Willing to do whatever God wants you to do. Let me just tell you, the vision, after 22 years, the vision of our church has not died down. If anything, it's got greater. There's more people to reach. We will not be satisfied till every person in Ventura County knows Jesus is Christ and Lord. Well, what are you going to do about it? I want to empower everyone and release everyone. Let's do something to make a difference in our county. Check it out. There are six high schools alone. Six. Even if we have 300 kids here on one Sunday night, that ain't jack. What is there, 15,000 students, just high school? Not to mention 10, 12,000 junior high. Most of them aren't going to church. Worse than that, most of them are going to hell. How, how much bigger is the church going to get? We just leave the numbers up to God. We're just going to keep reaching people, discipling people, winning people. And we're going to keep getting bothered till Jesus Christ comes back. Would you stand to your feet? Man, I've said it last year. We got, to get, we got to buy a couple houses, a men's home, a women's home. We got to help ladies caught in sex trafficking. We got to help ladies that are thinking, considering abortion. We got to help students that are being bullied at school. We got to do something about the homeless epidemic, the opioid epidemic. Are we just going to sit back and wait for God to raise somebody else up? Or are we going to say, God, here I am. Let me be an Ehud. Let me use my gifts. Let me be bothered to the point that I'm not just going to pray about it or talk about it. I want to do something about it. So with your hands lifted, would you lift your hands? Father, we thank you for your grace and your power and your mercy. And God, I said it from the get-go. I want to, by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, my message is not sufficient. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, bother us, disturb us, empower us to make a difference in our family, our school, our neighborhood, our city, and our county. Let you be glorified. We love you. We bless you. God, I pray that gifts would be stirred up, that ideas that we'd be stirred up, dreams would be stirred up, Bible studies are going to start, ministries are going to get uh, uh, begun. God, we thank you, God, that you're going to touch people because of us that are raising our hands right now. We're going to do something because we have a gift. We're going to do something because we're bothered. Do that in us and through us, we pray. We'll give you all the thanks and all the glory. And all the God's people said, amen. Come on, let's worship him.